Hello, Jeff Fisher here again. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about something which was a request. Uh, there was a request to elaborate on the graphing talk that I did a long time ago. So today I'm going to be talking about graph walking, specifically using something called Dijkstra's algorithm to solve graph walking problems and what some graph walking problems would be and why they exist. So first of all, graph walking. Now just a bit of a re refresher. A graph is nothing more than a set of vertices connected by edges. Now, the nature of these edges is something which kind of changes depending on which kind of graphing problem you're looking at, but it, that's the basic abstraction, and those, those are the terms we use to describe it. We're going to be specifically today talking about directed graphs. Um, directed graphs are, the, what they mean is if you have two vertices connected by an edge, if the edge is, say, only goes in one direction, or if the weight on the edge is different in different directions, like if it were a, something like a, a graph representing a plumbing system or something like that, this, the reason why it might only go in one direction is because, well, maybe there's the water only flows in one direction. Similarly, some sort of transportation network graphs, uh, there's different weights in different directions because their weight will be something like time, and just because of the nature of the, the terrain involved, it'll actually take a different amount of time to travel to a place than from that same place. So uh, directed graphs are common because they, they model real world things very well. Now weights themselves are just an abstract notion of some sort of expense for traversing the edge. So these typically refer to things like distance or time or maybe a monetary cost associated with using it, say if it's a, a toll booth or something like that. So, what we're usually wanting to find is what's the shortest path. Now, in this case, shortest is defined in terms of the lowest overall weight, uh, because whatever the weight is measuring is something you're considering the cost to be avoided or, or an expense that, you just, that you're that you trying to minimize by solving the problem. So, for example, this is a very simple transportation graph. Now, this one, just to keep things kind of simple to look at, I've made it uh, directed in both directions, so they're the constraint that you normally get on directed graphs is not as important here. Plus, it makes it easier to see how tightly interconnected things can be. And in this case, the weights could be something like maybe the time to travel between the points. The vertices could be cities and the edges would be highways or something like that. And this is a very common sort of model that you'll see in a lot of cases. Uh, if you're using like one of the online kind of uh, route planning or map uh, mapping programs or something like that, or one attached to a mass transit system, for example. This is a common problem they have to solve there because they're trying to find for you what's the fastest way through this graph of interconnected cities. And they're going to use a prop, use a solution like the one we're talking about today, although they probably have a, a simpler way of approximating it uh, just for their own expense overhead because they're their size of the problem for them is very large if they know about every city. So Dijkstra's algorithm is a way to solve this uh, and it's 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 a very it's a very kind of simple and elegant algorithm. We're going to walk through it. So what it is is it's a graph traversal algorithm. Uh, it specifically is designed to work on directed graphs with non-negative edge weights. Now, why would an edge have negative weights? Well, there's there's lots of reasons, but in a lot of real-world things, you actually don't encounter negative edge weights very often. So this graph this uh, this solution actually works quite well. So. What it tells you is not just the shortest distance between two points, but you give it a starting point, and when the algorithm is complete, it'll be able to tell you the shortest path to any other any other vertex in the entire graph. Uh, and then there's a way that you can very easily determine from any one of those what's the specific path to take, not just how long would it take. So. It's very useful for these things. Um, in terms of looking at abstract data types, like I talked about last week, it's based on a bunch of sets and a priority queue. The priority queue is actually kind of the important part of this, and it's what actually changes the computational complexity of this depending on your implementation. So it's very sensitive to how you implement that. So we're going to walk through an example of that same graph I had earlier and how you'd use something like Dijkstra's algorithm to solve this. So we're going to start from A. Now how this works is you have you, put, you start out the algorithm by putting all the vertices in your, your unvisited set. We're going to have this notion of visiting a node, and that's how we're going to traverse things. So we start out with everything in the unvisited set. And we know we're done when we visited everything in the unvisited set. There's other special cases where you can tell it's done too, but for this case, we're just going to use that one because it's easy. Um, and also, the thing to remember is what we're going to be doing is every time we visit a node, we have a queue of the next, we have a priority queue, so it's sorted um, 
based on the next vertices to visit after the current one we're visiting. So what we're going to be doing is every time we visit a node, everything it's uh, everything it connects to, we're going to be putting all those vertices inside that queue. And the queue is going to be sorted based on the total distance to get to that vertex. And so we're always going to be taking the shortest one. It's very important to always take the shortest or the, the closest one overall, uh, because otherwise you can end up having problems where you have to redo huge parts of the algorithm. And the algorithm itself is based on the idea that you, that you never need to do that. So that's the important part, and that's why, uh, depending on how you implement that sorted queue, uh, that can be the big expense in the program. So we'll talk about that a bit more later. But first of all, to walk through the graph itself. So we're going to start at A. First thing you do is you say, okay, A then, the distance from A to A is zero. And what we're going to do is everything it's connected to, all of its neighboring vertices, we're going to say, we're going to record how we got there, like which, which vertex we visited it from, and the total distance from A to get to that vertex, assuming that's the right path. So that's why here we say C is A3, B is A2, H is A5. So now we've visited A, it's removed from the unvisited set. So that's why it's red. So now we're going to look at the next closest thing. So the the total length of path that we have so far, the shortest one is B. So we go to B, and now what we do is we, we add that 2 onto the weights of its neighbors. Now you see we didn't change C here because it went from it would have gone from A3 to B3. So that, that doesn't make it a shorter path, so we're not going to change anything. Um, but these other neighbors now, D and G, are added in with the B as their, their referring vertex, and the total weight is now 5 and 4 respectively. So now we move on. The next thing, of course, the shortest weight is now going to be the C. So we go to C, and we look at the only neighbor it has which is not visited yet is D. But if we took A3, so 3, its total distance, plus 3, the distance to get to D, we'd end up with 6, which is greater than 5. So it's no, there's no point in uh, looking at that one, so we don't change D. So now we go into G. And now this is an interesting point, because this is where you actually end up the how you need to actually solve the entire algorithm before you've actually solved any part of it. Um, well, you need to have visited all the nodes in a, any subgraph of the graph in order for you to know the solution for that subgraph. So, for example, here we're going to say, okay, the way to get to I is now going to be G7. But this is actually not the best answer. There's a better way to get there. Uh, and this is going to be through H, right? So, now, oh, and similarly, we don't change D here because it would have been 7, which is longer than, greater than 5, so we ignore that. So now, we remove the G7 because now we're going to visit H. And by visiting H, we realize it's now going to be H6 because H is 5, and we add the weight of 1 to get to I, so it's H6. So this kind of changing the, or improving your answers as you go along until you've fin finished visiting a vertex, at which point you know it's, its total length, or its total uh, path length to get there. Uh, this changing of things over time is how the algorithm actually works, and it's why you kind of need to finish the whole thing before you can use many of the results you've determined. So now we move on to the next, which is D. And of course, following as with the other ones, we, we mark the, the neighboring edges. Now we do 6, or now we do I, it's done, it's H6. And of course, move on to the next the E and the F. And now at this point, we've actually determined uh, the total distance from A to any other vertex in the graph. And also, if you're trying to find the specific, um, the specific path to get there, the shortest path, you just find the destination node, like say in this case, you'd find F, say, and then to find out, okay, well, what's the, we know it's 10 hours, say, to get there. Well, what's the actual shortest path itself that gives us that 10 hours? Well, you go backward. You go, all right, well, F says it came from D, so we go to D. D says it comes from B, so we go to B, and B says it comes from A. So we go, okay, that, that reverse list, we just flip that, and that's the path we take. We go A, B, D, F. That gets us there in 10 hours, and that's the shortest path. And we've proven it using Dijkstra's algorithm. So what's some analysis about this, just to, to kind of wrap up? Well, Dijkstra's original algorithm ran in big O of V squared, where V is the number of vertices in the graph. Um, there's actually a factor of the edges there, but it, it gets dominated by the V squared. Now, that was in 1959. 
Now this was improved later on by using a better um, by using a better priority queue because Dijkstra's original algorithm was just a, a list that had to be traversed every time. So for every vertex, you had to potentially look at the weights of every other or the speculative path length of every other vertex. So that's why it was B squared. Uh, this, of course, has been improved later on. Uh, so in this case, it ends up being the big O of the number of edges plus the number of vertices times the logarithm of the number of vertices. So this is because of a, uh, a Fibonacci heap used to implement, which is a, a specific kind of data structure used to implement priority queues. So that was an improvement by uh, Fredman and Tarjan in 1984. Um, so that's you, it usually doesn't matter which one of these it is from the perspective of thinking about the design, but if you were implementing one, you'd want to make sure that you come up with an implementation which has the, the, the best computational complexity. So you'd want that, that later version. Um, so this works on directed graphs specifically, like, well, any directed graph with non-negative edge weights. Um, so the, the, that's the one kind of big requirement of it. There's actually ways it can work on graphs which have holes in them and gaps between them. Uh, I ignored that for the, the description just because it just adds extra cases. Um, and for very, very simple graphs, like what's called a, an acyclic graph, one that has no, there's no way of getting back to where you started by taking a cycle through the graph. If it's just acyclic, um, what's more often just referred to as a tree, uh, you can actually find the best traversal by using a linear time algorithm, which is just called a topological ordering. But in general, uh, any kind of directed graph with non-negative weights can be solved very effectively by using Dijkstra's algorithm. So as before, that, that uh, example is something that's kind of along the lines of what you'd see as this is how to solve uh, a transportation problem on a map or something like that. But it applies in many, many situations. And another thing which is kind of interesting is that this algorithm itself is an example of a concept called dynamic programming. Um, and this is something which you know, I, I've, I've alluded to it before a few times, um, but it's, it's something that generally if you're a computer scientist, this will be something which makes the algorithm kind of useful in the sense of it's a good example of how to think about problems in a dynamic programming way, uh, which is just a way of using sub-problems to solve broader problems. So. Anyway, I hope this was useful, and uh, let me know what you think of it. And if you have any questions or any other uh, requests of things I should talk about, let me know or leave a comment here. Thanks.